The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? Today, we're delighted to welcome back Ben Z. Kluger, who is professor of neurology and medicine at the University of Rochester and also directs the neuropalliative care service there and is the president of the International Neuropalliative Care Society. Welcome back to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Benzi. Thanks for having me back. And we are delighted to welcome Christine Ritchie, who been, we've been trying to find a date for forever, and we finally found one uh, that she can join. So this is terrific. We're so thrilled to have you on. And she's professor of medicine at MGH and Harvard Medical School, Massachusetts General Hospital, that is, MGH, and director of the Center on Aging and Serious Illness and a board member of the Inter- National Neuropalliative Care Society. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Christine. Thanks, Alex. It's really great to be here. And we're from the UK joining us is Ed Richfield, who is a consultant geriatrician in Bristol and chair of the clinical um, committee for the International Neuropalliative Care Society. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today, Ed. Okay, thanks very much for having me. Sounds like, Alex, we have a theme International Neuro Palliative Care. So we're going to be talking about that theme throughout this entire podcast. But before we do, we always go to a song request. And I forget, who, who are we turning to, Alex, for the song request? I think Benzie or Christine. Benzie? Yeah, I, can, uh, take it. I think me and Christine had a similar idea for a song, which we both love the Beatles. And uh, with the theme of Neuro Palliative Care in this international society, we felt like Come Together would be a great uh, great song for, for launching the podcast great choice. Today. Here's just a snippet at the start. Here come old flat top, he come grooving up slowly. He got juju eyeball, he won. Holy roller, he got hair down to his knee. Got to be a joker, he just do what he please. Come together. First of all, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we had Benzie on in 2020 to talk about uh, right when uh, after he published as I think lead author JAMA Internal Medicine paper on Parkinson's and palliative care uh, randomized controlled trial. I encourage all of our listeners to to check that out. But we had a chance to talk to Benzie about first of all, kind of what got him interested in neuro palliative care. That's going to be the subject today. So. I'm hoping to turn to Christine and Ed to really start off the discussion about kind of why, why they got interested in this. And then we could talk about, like, do we need A, is this a specialty onto itself? Do we need a whole nother society on it? And just learn a little bit more. And maybe at the end, we can hear some practical tips that we can bring into our own practices. But Christine, uh, you've been a, a figure in both geriatrics and palliative care nationally <laughs> in the U.S., internationally. How did you get interested in neuropalliative care? Thanks for asking, Eric. So as a geriatrician and a palliative care physician, this is the space we often occupy, which is the space of caring for people living with dementia across the care continuum. And actually starting uh, with my time at the University of California, San Francisco, I had the opportunity to spend more and more time with my colleagues in neurology and psychiatry, geriatrics and palliative care, and saw all of us bringing important pieces to the puzzle and yet still sort of staying maybe more in our lanes than was helpful. So seeing the opportunity for better care in this space was part of what drove me to it. Also because palliative care has historically been more sort of in the oncology world, thinking about how we might bring it more into the world of, of neurology and dementia care was attractive to me. And then last but not least, my father had Lewy body dementia and I had the privilege of caring for him in the last years of his life in my home. And that certainly spurred on a deep desire to do work in this area. Thank you, Christine. How about you, Ed? Yeah, I say thanks for having me on. Um, so I guess uh, you know, just my day-to-day -day work as a geriatrician, and we see, uh, you know, I run a, a ward full of um, older people, um, actually younger people as well now with frailty and multimorbidity, and 
within that, we'd see a lot of folks who've uh, got neurological conditions, often combined with frailty syndromes and um, and multimorbidity. Um, and we tend to see people um, after they're admitted to hospital, so often at a point of crisis in their life, and often, and I think that's really when you feel the uh, the absence of prior palliative care. So folks where they haven't had any particular planning, people haven't discussed um, goals of treatment and so forth. And a lot of our job would be um, just in general geriatrics, talking to folks and families and trying to work out, um, if you like, best interest decisions because folks have maybe lost the ability to take part in conversations and set their own goals of care. So, you know, we've I think as geriatricians are working on the ward every day, you very much feel that uh, that role for, for for palliative care in its wider sense, and um, and and the absence of it, and you really sort of feel for families and and patients, and you sort of live it with them, um, the problems around that. Um, so that was sort of my clinical background, and then the opportunity came up to do a PhD um, looking at palliative care and Parkinson's disease. Uh, so um, I was already um, subspecializing in movement disorders. So it seemed like a natural fit, really. And you kind of think, well, as a geriatrician, if you're not going to take the opportunity to do, a, you know, to take three years to look at that, then, um, you know, probably probably time to get out the day job. And it seemed too good an opportunity to, dis- to dismiss, really. So that's, um, that was my way uh, into this as a, as, a, as a specialty. And can I ask, International Neuropalliative Care Society? Sus- Institute? Society. Society. When, when was that dreamed up um, and when did it start? So it, it was born, I guess the, the idea for it maybe it goes back about five years uh, that there was a kind of a group of us in the American Academy of Neurology who had a um, international neuropalliative care, what we were calling a summit. And it was uh, four hours on an afternoon. It was uh, in an outside hotel because we didn't want to pay to be official. And it built up over uh, that four years. The last time we held it, there were over 100 people who, who joined from, from all over the world. And so it was, building, it was building momentum. And I think at that time, within the American Academy of Neurology, there was a pain and palliative care section, which is now a palliative care section we split off. But it seemed like we weren't really able to do what we wanted to do uh, within that section, you know, that we wanted uh, greater networking. And I think one of the things, you know, which goes into, you know, why there's two geriatricians and a neurologist here is that I think we all recognized that we really needed it to be interdisciplinary. Uh, that I think all of us clinically research education were collaborating with geriatricians, we were collaborating with palliative care, we were collaborating with chaplains, with social workers. And there wasn't any place where we all hung out, but we were all interested in what everyone else was doing. Um, the other part of it, the international piece, um, be interesting also to get Ed's take on it, was um, I think it was actually 2012, we had our first international Parkinson's palliative care working group, and we had some people from the UK and Australia. And it was just eye opening to me how different palliative care looked under different systems. And so it seemed, and there was a huge opportunity for me to learn because prior to that, I was kind of working with the U.S. blinders, you know, that hospice needs to be based on prognosis. And the guy from Australia was like, that doesn't make any sense. It's based on need here. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yes, you know, it does. And, we, and we found that in other, other work that, you know, I think what's one of the beautiful things here is that by comparing how things are working in different contexts, you know, we could actually even push policy with evidence. Um, in, in the study that you mentioned, uh, caregivers in Canada were doing statistically significantly better at baseline before we started our intervention, and, and, and that has to do with the you know the social support structure in Canada, you know, which, which I think is a, you know a, an important lesson for for us that we can you know also be advocates and champions for uh, better models of care, not just better uh, direct clinical care. And when we think about neuropalliative care, how are we defining that? So defining it uh, in terms of, I guess, two things. You know, one is recognizing that people with neurologic illness have uh, palliative care needs. Uh, but the reason for calling it neuropalliative is that they're unique needs. Um, and, and, you know, we can, you know, have a debate or argue about that. Uh, but I think, you know, if you kind of go across the board, if you look at pain and 
patients with neurologic illness like Parkinson's, there are unique causes of pain in somebody with Parkinson's. So symptom management is different. Symptom assessment is different. Uh, the way it affects somebody's identity, you know, with Parkinson's or, or dementia is very different than how it affects somebody's identity with cancer. Uh, the struggles that caregivers have yeah. is, is different. And oh, so, so yeah. um, I care for people with neurologic problems, heart problems, renal problems, pretty much every organ system. Like, does there need to be a international society of cardiac palliative care, international society of renal palliative care? And do I have to like belong to all of these societies in order to, because they're unique needs for every one of these. How much of this is like the, the medicine loves especially academic medicine loves super sub sub specialization. Like you, you have your niche. Yep. How, how should I think about that when it comes to neuropalliative care? Yeah, for, for me, and uh, again, I'd love to hear what uh, Christine and Ed have to say as a neurologist. Uh, part of the reason I, I'm actually pushing for it is, is I, I think that there's a need for ownership. If no one's really owning neuropalliative care and, and, it, it ends up being owned by nobody or or it's kind of deferred to palliative medicine. And I feel like if we're thinking about palliative care as something that's going to be done proactively, if we're thinking about primary palliative care as something that's going to start at the time of diagnosis, something that's going to prepare caregivers, uh, that there needs to be, you know, some, some ownership there and, and to move forward as a field research-wise, but even clinically, um, you know, it, it to me feels very important that neurologists and others, you know, geriatricians that other people, you know, take some ownership for it. And, and this may be true for, for nephrology. Uh, it's probably actually needs to be done more for cancer, you know, that, that, you know, that if people are not taking ownership for it, they're not integrating it, they're not embedding it in their clinics. And so as a palliative care doctor, you know, that's one perspective on it. But as somebody, you know, closely associated with the disease, if I'm not owning and associated with palliative care and it's not my job, you know, it's, it's not going to move forward very fast at all. I think it's also just that I think one of the big differences is cognition, isn't it? So I think we'd all buy into the fact that, that palliative care can and should start as appropriate from the time of diagnosis. But I just think it's even more important in conditions where there's a high cognitive burden because of that loss of autonomy. And so if, if as you say, if uh, neurologists or geriatricians or whoever the, uh, the, the chronic care physician is, if you like, um, is not involved in that, then those opportunities are lost because um, almost by definition, then you end up with a, a more prognostic model of care. If folks aren't identifying needs early on, and then you've lost autonomy um, for so many people. Um, I think that's one of the big differences. I guess the other thing for me, from my experience as a geriatrician would be that um, you know, as a generalist, uh, it's obviously most of my job is as a, as a geriatrician. You know, we have good training in... Uh, in those other conditions, and lots of people feel comfortable managing heart failure and COPD, and um, maybe to a lesser extent renal disease. But um, but actually, a lot of generalists feel uncomfortable managing neurological conditions, and that, I think the same is true for palliative specialists if they haven't had specific neurology training. And so people tend to shy away from them, and and that's all the more easy now with the call for. Uh, palliative care for non-malignant disease right if I was uh, working in a hospice uh, I would naturally nothing move towards COPD and heart failure partly because they're very big and partly because they're conditions I feel comfortable with and so there's a real danger I think then that folks who have neurological disease would be missed out. And Christine when you think about this too um, from a like a dementia perspective there there's been a lot of talk in palliative care about um the palliative care needs of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and the need for increasing specialty palliative care for those groups. But, you know, to be honest, we don't do a super great job of training palliative care specialists on how to take care of people with dementia. Um, I'm wondering from your perspective, how do you think about that? I couldn't agree with you more, Eric. I think part of what's actually drawn me to this space is seeing that this is a real opportunity for us in palliative care to go deeper, to go richer, and to really increase our competence. Part of what I think is attractive about this International Neuropalliative Care Society is that it brings together people who might not otherwise rub shoulders 
to think about what that looks like. What, what would providing high quality, highly competent palliative care for people living with dementia look like? And it has to come from a, 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 an array of perspectives from neurology, from geriatric psychiatry, from nursing, from geriatrics, from palliative care. And it's hard to get all those folks at the same picnic table. And so part of, I think, the opportunity is to do that. I do feel like it's a tremendous opportunity for us in palliative care to go deeper with our training around dementia care. And I'll say that in my work here at Mass General, where I do a lot of dementia care, that discomfort with dementia care is certainly not just uh, for those with palliative care training. There's generally, I think, a discomfort around dementia care. And so our opportunity to both normalize the relevance of palliative care and dementia care from the beginning to you know the, the end of life with our primary care colleagues and with our other subspecialty colleagues is something that I think is incredibly compelling. Yeah, I, I wonder if you you could talk about uh, what the fields have to learn from each other. So I'll give you an example from outside the field of neuropalliative care. So bioethics, for example, has to learn from palliative care the importance of relationship and building relationship and attention to emotions of the patient and the family members rather than, you know, a decision dictated from some conference room from on high based on lofty principles. Are there, are there elements that neurology has to learn from palliative care or geriatrics or that palliative care has to learn from neurology in this case? And anyone could talk. I'm just going to throw it out there. I can, uh, I, I can start. Um, when, when I got started, um, Gene Kuttner uh, at, at the University of Colorado, where I was, was uh, really in- instrumental uh, for me getting things off the ground. At, at that time, and it's still the case, I think, in most places, palliative care was really not taught or taught well in neurology. I think a lot of program directors checked off the box because we did brain death exams, and that's kind of palliative, and so we're, we're doing palliative training for our trainees. But I, I knew almost almost really nothing about it, and, and so it was you know, very helpful for me to learn how palliative care doctors approach symptom management, Mm -hmm. uh, how palliative care doctors approach advanced care planning. Uh, Part of the reason actually I approached Gene in the first place is that I felt very stuck as a neurologist. I would see somebody with Alzheimer's disease and at a certain point, you know, I could watch the mocha go down. I could take away their driver's license. I could start Aricept, but I, I really wasn't doing anything that I felt satisfied with. Mm-hmm. And so, so talking to Jean and asking her and looking at things through her perspective was, was just, you know, it gave me a whole new set of tools that I, I felt helpful again, you know, and, and so with, without palliative care, you know, I, I might've, you know, burnt out, um, you know, just cause it, there's uh, without palliative care. I mean, it seems like neurodegenerative diseases are just horribly depressing. And maybe just to add to that and some of the work that, that uh, had the good fortune of doing with Krista Harrison at UCSF, we found that a lot of what neurologists do feel uncomfortable with relates to what you just talked about, Benzie, which is sort of the communication space and the anticipatory guidance and the sort of weaving together of the complexity and what you spoke about with respect to sort of dementia and multimorbidity, that those things are, you know, diagnosis is sort of bread and butter, but the sort of other pieces of the of the of the caring, caring for the caregiver those pieces are much less uh, part of the traditional armamentarium. And so I think there's a real opportunity there. I also think to to answer your question, Alex, in the opposite direction, what can palliative care learn? I think getting just a little bit more sophisticated in our understanding of dementia, um, understanding dementia subtypes so that we can actually provide better quality anticipatory guidance, understanding what medications really are highly problematic to provide for people with uh, cognitive impairment, especially with dementia or or, uh, Parkinson's disease for that matter, being aware of some of the treatment strategies that are relevant both for supporting caregivers of people living with dementia, but also people who have dementia with respect to behavioral symptoms, which a lot of folks in palliative care are, you know, haven't had a lot of training in. Things like, uh, you know, drooling, uh, movement disorders, Again, things that are just not sort of the typical 
bread and butter symptom management issues for, for many in palliative care. Ed, anything you'd add? Yeah, I'd agree with all of those. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's one of the nice things about it is the way we all learn from each other. I think the, um, so we have like a Parkinson's disease, uh, palliative care, uh, multi multidisciplinary team meeting, which we'd, it runs like once a month, but we quite frequently get phone calls about patients in the meantime. And it, and they go all three ways, you know, so um, I can think this month, you know, I phoned uh, one of my neurology colleagues asking about um, something sort of <laughs> that seemed quite, quite odd to me. Um, and with his advice on, I got phone calls from um, the palliative care consultant asking me, um, some specifics about drug management, you know, and, and it works all three ways. So it's, it's actually really good. And I think probably one of the biggest lessons um, that I've learned, and because a lot of outs, in our in our, most of our practice now is in hospital, um, so we do have clinics still, but in hospital, you know, there's a lot of time pressure, um, particularly through the pandemic and things, and actually learning the importance of structures because actually you can have good communication skills and you can care a lot and really want to try and do a good job but if you do it in a, a structure that isn't uh, enabling it's really difficult um and you know i think we have this sort of idea that maybe it's a uk idea i don't know there's sort of stereotypes about different specialties and you know oh and you all just don't like doing this or they don't feel comfortable doing it but you know you try try doing advanced care planning in 15 minutes you can't do it so if your appointments are 15 minutes long you really can't do it. So it's about having the structures around you that enable you to do it well. I think that's probably the biggest thing I've learned. Okay, I have a follow-up question. Ed, when you said all three um, areas are important, I think you're talking about geriatrics, palliative care, and neurology. And, right, yeah. and yet the society is called the International Neuropalliative Care Society. And geriatrics got dropped. So I wonder what I wonder if there was thinking that maybe we should be the International Neuro Jerry Pal Society. And then my follow-up question to that is, did you decide not to do that because you knew that Jerry Pal was trademarked and you'd have to pay us, you know, thousands <laughs> of dollars in royalties? I love the idea, Alex, by the way. I do think Jerry Pal is a really important piece of this conversation. And again, getting back to some of the work that Krista and I have done together. Geriatric, what we're seeing is sort of deficits in a lot of the care provided is sort of this interesting combination of geriatrics and palliative care. So uh, I don't know, we might have to pay you thousands of dollars to add that to the to the title. I, I would say that we're having parallel conversations. So I, I think geriatrics is actually a big piece of the puzzle, but in, in the pediatric neuropalliative care space, there's kind of a, it's like a parallel, but... Uh, smaller and cuter universe <laughs> uh, 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 but but you know it's a similar thing where you know with uh, kids with you know complex neurologic illnesses and developmental delay and epilepsy and things like that again it's this kind of no man's land where where there's definitely a need and, and I think people recognize it for interdisciplinary care interdisciplinary research interdisciplinary conversations that aren't happening and so we're part part of the hope is that the international neuropalliative care society can kind of serve as a host in a home, you know, for, for geriatrics. Uh, neuro-oncology is actually another space where, where we're seeing similar things. Uh, pediatrics is another. So, you know, you know, I think we talked maybe even before the, the podcast started about, you know, how we came up with the society so that this could be the main course. And then, you know, geriatrics, pediatrics, all these other things, I think would be task force and working groups and, you know, hopefully be part of the bread and butter of the society as it develops. Just to add, because we haven't given much voice to it, is the very important role of geriatric psychiatry. Uh, it's a small, you know, field, and yet they offer so many incredibly complementary perspectives to this space. And so, uh, I think we'd be remiss not to at least also talk about the value that they offer, especially around complex behavioral symptoms. Who should join the International Society of? The International Neuropal of Care Society. Well, I will get that down by the end of the podcast. Well, I think that's it's really one of the strengths, isn't it? And that's emerged in the last year is that I think a lot of a lot of the societies say everyone's welcome, but I think in the INPCS, genuinely everyone is welcome, and that's really been um, because it's been set set there from the foundation of the society, and um, and and genuinely everyone's views are really respected and held tightly, and um, 
and 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 a genuine place to learn from each other. And I think because it is such a relatively new field, and because there genuinely are areas of uh, which each discipline and I mean that outside the medical sense, you know, right throughout the, the multidisciplinary team, are genuinely bringing things uh, which other people go, oh yeah, that's really interesting. You know, the fact that you know people will be bringing things that even like professors of neurology or professors of geriatrics will be saying well that's that you've added to my knowledge and that and that's a really great thing actually um so like certainly we've been flagging it up to trainees and um you know and uh you know specialist nurses there's so many folks i think that should 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 genuinely feel welcome to come and join i think i think jerry pal listeners would be great members <laughs> 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 but uh, I mean, certainly, you know, we have, you know, Ed's the head of our clinical task force and, and you know, a lot of our task force, I think, are speaking to the, I don't, uh, the hunger, you know, for, for a society in the space. So there's definitely, you know, a hunger for, for clinical uh, guidelines and, and for clinical uh, colleagues, you know, to, to talk things over for people who are trying to get clinics off the ground in this space. Uh, same thing for education, talking, you know, to Christine's points about, you know, needing tools and better things for palliative care fellowships, better thing for neurology residencies, uh, research. Uh, there's certainly a lot of opportunity there. One, one of the other things that's unique, which we haven't talked about, but it was very important to me as we got the society off the ground, was to have a place where uh, patients and families who are living with neurologic illnesses would be treated as the experts they are um, and, and to really have a voice and be integrated into our society. So in, on our board, there, there's a, a patient, there are care partners. Um, and, and so I, I think for, for patients and families who want to change the way care is provided and change standards of care, that this can be a very powerful society to join. And, and hopefully it's, uh, you know, with our meeting and other things that we're offering as we're getting off the ground that we, you know, give, give people what they, what they want and uh, provide some value back and hopefully start to move the needle. Yeah. And I'm also wondering, as we as we think about neuropalliative care and potentially integrating neuropalliative care into our own sites here, I just think back to your JAMA neuro paper, uh, Benzi. Uh, so it was more of a pragmatic study, did it at three different sites, but all three different sites, if I remember correctly, did a little bit differently. I think one site included a palliative care specialist, another site didn't include a palliative care specialist. How should we think about integrating neuropalliative care within our own practices? Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. So we're, we're getting a project off the ground right now in collaboration with the Parkinson's Foundation. Uh, and this is a neurologist perspective. And, you know, and Ed and Christine can give you know more palliative and, and geriatric perspective. But um, that one's really based around uh, we operationalized palliative care around five pillars. Um, and, and that was one of the big lessons, I think, from the study that you mentioned, is it didn't matter how you did it, as long as you were doing it, as long as you had a checklist and you were systematic about, you know, what we operationalized from that study was that you were doing caregiver assessment. Um, so asking caregivers how they were doing, asking if they were overwhelmed, checking in with patients about psychosocial issues like grief, guilt, isolation, uh, doing annual advanced care planning being systematic about checking for non-motor symptoms, which are some things that always fall between the cracks, uh, things like depression, constipation, pain. Uh, people don't know whether they should talk to their neurologist or primary care doctor about it. They're often embarrassed to bring it up. And then the fifth pillar was to refer to specialist palliative care or to hospice uh, when it was appropriate. Um, so that's how we operationalized that. And, and it'll be interesting to see how this project develops because I think in some sites, they're going to go to a more of a primary palliative care model. In some sites, it may be that there is a single nurse practitioner who is doing more of the neural palliative care than other people. Uh, but the important thing is that, you know, we're really kind of thinking about palliative care on a population level, kind of as a public health good, rather than as an individual thing that's most important for somebody in crisis. And just to build on what Benzie said, I think the building, it sort of depends on what resources you have, right? So if you have resources that are present where there's a hunger, there's a bunch of people interested, regardless of who those people are, that's the place to start and to have them start as champions. And that's look, that looks really different, lots of different places. We have some colleagues who are at a community hospital nearby and you know they've just brought in the people who are right there who cared a lot about the space and they're just jumping in and digging in. So it, I don't know that there's 
to, to your point earlier, Eric, that there's a one size fits all. Yeah, I'm just trying to think about piecing it together. Like like in the dementia space, I just think back to... So there was a study in seven European countries, 78 nursing homes, the PACE Steps to Success trial. Uh, I think it was JAMA Internal Medicine again. Uh, it was a negative study. Their multi-component palliative care intervention using non-specialist palliative care just didn't do anything. And I'm wondering, does it look different for dementia than it does Parkinson's, Christine? And how should we be thinking about what, unfortunately, is a lot of more negative studies around Alzheimer's and related dementias? I I think it's a really great point, Eric. I'm glad you brought it up. And, And that is that there's this sort of surprising piece here where palliative care interventions have historically shown so much benefit in so many different settings and in so many different chronic serious conditions. And yet we don't, we're not seeing that in dementia, which makes me think we may have some, some opportunities here to better understand what the true positive palliative care components are. And they probably do look different than in these other studies, but you know, the, the study uh, that showed that in um, the systematic review by Karen Quinn and, and his colleagues that showed that essentially all the benefits related to palliative care were shown pretty consistently with some exceptions for cancer and COPD and heart failure, and yet didn't show up for dementia. And then people who referred patients to high referring, you know, physicians who are high referrers to palliative care, that those patients with dementia were more likely to die in the hospital and more likely to use the ED, whereas all the other conditions. We didn't see that. Makes me think we have some opportunities to really learn what the secret sauce is, right? That palliative care for dementia is going to look just a little bit different than palliative care has historically looked for some of our other chronic serious illnesses. It almost highlights also the importance of palliative care for individuals with, let's say, advanced dementias, a lot more focused on caregivers, families, nurses, while it's still important to focus on the patient and there's plenty of palliative care needs there, the system of care is just so important. Yeah, and it gets back to what Ed was saying just a few minutes ago about the structures and how our structures really don't lend themselves to care of the family or care of the caregiver. We really don't have those mechanisms in place by and large. I wonder if there's, I don't know, I feel like as a, again, in my day job, I mean, so many of the folks with dementia, by the time we're identifying needs, we're seeing them in crisis. Like I, I spend, I would say, a lot more time seeing people with dementia and their families in crisis than I do with Parkinson's disease. I, mean, I see mm. too many of them in crisis as well. But I also, in my clinic, you know, I, we have the opportunity to be embedding practice and helping people out and, and making sure we put things in place before that. Whereas I really feel like... Um, uh, with dementia, which you know is a huge part of my inpatient load or inpatient job, it's not a, not a load, but you know, uh, that actually um, um, that I see people in crisis and I'm firefighting. And uh, again, you know, if you're doing a ward round of 16 patients, you know, it's very difficult to firefight effectively. And so often, what we do is flag things up and then we're handing back to the community actually how well resourced are the community to manage these things. So I think probably there's going to be something really interesting uh, with dementia. But my bet is that the hospital is a really good place to identify unmet need because we're seeing a lot of people in one geographic space. So you've got lots of folks, a lot of need in one place. So it's easier to maybe screen and identify. And But then you're going to need structures in the community to manage that need. And the hospital is not going to be the right place to do that. Um, I wonder maybe that's part of what's unique there. Yeah. And um, I'm also wondering, maybe in our last couple of minutes, we can talk um, about kind of lessons you've you've all learned, um, especially for our audience, like key key pearls you've learned doing neuropalliative care over the last couple of years. And I'm going to turn it over to, you, to start off with you, Ed, as as you start working, you know, as you started working with uh, Parkinson's folks and doing palliative Parkinson's care. Any key important lessons you learned as a geriatrician on how to care for patients with neurological diseases, including Parkinson's? Sure. Thank you for um, inviting me to go first. That was very kind. (laughs) 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 
Uh, yeah, I think, um, so I think the first one was um, having increased awareness myself and an understanding. I think, uh, I think it's one of those areas where I really felt like my PhD stood me in good stead just because I'd spent so long reading the qualitative literature. Um, so actually, maybe that's one point, actually, is to read the qualitative literature. I know we all focus on quant, but blimey, you learn some stuff from reading the qual literature, don't you? And really having that, it's a horrible term, but that theoretical framework that's kind of embedded. And so you're, I think your approach, I, I found that it really affected my practice, my personal practice. Um, so that Give I was a, going... A couple of examples of how? Yeah, so like I think going into a consultation with, um, with those things in the back of my mind, like I really... Um, did a lot of reading about the diagnostic process and I'm, I quite feel quite strongly that that echoes right down through the course of the disease. Um, so for example, and this is hardly revolutionary, but the first thing I do when people come to clinic is, is check if, what they know about why they're there and why they think they're coming in. And like in PD, for example, you know, you've got one group of folks who it's, it's validation. They, they know they, they're pretty sure they've got PD. They've been researching it on the internet. They're coming in. And then, thank goodness you told me this. I knew it was going on. I've been feeling it for years. And so their response to being diagnosed is completely different to my other person who comes in having had a fall. And their GP's noticed a tremor, and they've got no idea why they're here. And the fact that before I was kind of going through the same diagnostic process, right, for these two people with completely different needs. Mm -hmm. So that would be one example. Um, and, and I suppose the other thing that's really challenging myself uh, so I would have, you know, we all would have, I'm sure, red flags in our head for when, you know, like certain patients, you think, gosh, this is, okay, this is now getting, it, we've turned a corner, you know, we've got form visual hallucinations, we've got recurrent falls, whatever, whatever the flags are that are in our head. And challenging myself to say, have I been open in this consultation to advanced care planning? Am I picking up the cues? Am I giving off the signals that say I'm open to it? Um, because you know, I had a, I remember one, what, I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, but one really interesting uh, thing from my research where a chap um, mentioned that he hadn't had the chance to speak to someone. He was right at the end of his disease and he was still talking about his diagnostic process. He said, I didn't get the chance to speak to anyone. I wonder whose job it was to, to initiate the conversation. So to challenge myself, and I, and I actually kind of do that as I'm in the, in the consultation, you know, change your body language, make sure you're doing the right things to, to trigger that. Thank you, Ed. Christine, how about from you? Lessons you've learned, clinical I, pearls. I, I love what you brought up, Ed, with respect to the diagnostic process. And I would just maybe add one additional piece to that, which is the whole importance of diagnostic disclosure. I think we think about diagnostic disclosure when we think about other kinds of bad giving bad news, and we don't think about it in the same way for dementia. And yet for many people, the D word is more scary than the C word. And being very thoughtful and careful in the ways that we like to be in palliative care around diagnostic disclosure for dementia, I think it's critically important. And it can be pretty complicated and difficult, especially if there's lack of insight by, by the person living with dementia on, on you know, their limitations. The other thing I would say is that the importance of finding out what matters to people when they're able to tell us what matters is just so critical. And often those times they're let, they just go by. And by the time we're actually given the opportunity to find out what matters, it's too late for that person to be able to speak into it. And we really have to rely, rely on their care partners. And then the last thing I would say is, is the critical importance of and anticipatory guidance that takes into account more than just the medical piece, but the psychosocial piece, the environmental piece, what kind of support systems are or are not in place. And those are things that happily there are increasing literature to guide us on, but that historically, you know, we haven't really gone there to, to address. That's a great point, Christina. I, um, it's amazing you know, the amount of frustration that always comes around finances for caregivers uh, around a patient's finances yet you know thinking about advanced financial planning for when we diagnose somebody with dementia is is often sorely missed sorely missed not addressed at all and uh, it's such an important issue yeah how about you Benzie? yeah uh, uh, the things I had wrote down and uh, Ed and Christine covered them I, I think Having a good roadmap is, is so important. 
uh, as a neurologist, you know, we're, we're kind of trained, I think, in, in an attempt to maintain people's hope to say everybody is different, which is, I think, helpful for us as neurologists, but it's not very helpful for individual patients. And so, you know, really talking about a roadmap, and as, you know, Christine says, you know, talking about the roadmap in terms of what's important, you know, can I continue to travel? You know, it's not just about how long, it's also about how well. Um, it's my friend and colleague Bob Holloway puts it. And I, th I think the last thing, you know, kind of circling back around to come together is uh, really the importance of, of a team. And that, that was the lesson even before the society, as I got into this field, it, it was very quickly apparent that there was no way that I could do everything I wanted to do by myself, that there were uh, threats to identity and spiritual and existential issues that was helpful to have a chaplain. Uh, there's financial issues where you need a social worker. You know, there's things where you need good relationships with hospice, you need to know uh, people in the nursing home world, you know, and so it really, you know, takes a village to take care of somebody uh, with a person centered lens, you know, with dementia or really any complex serious neurologic illness. So I, I think that was a big lesson for me early on. All right. I'll tell you, you've convinced me. I'm really interested in neuropalliative care. How do I learn more or jo join the International Neuropalliative Care Society? Got it right this time. Glad you asked. So it's at www.inpcs. Uh, we're having neuropalliative is two letters, inpcs.org. Uh, um, and there's membership there. We're having our first meeting, which we have a great agenda for November 4th through 6th. It'll be a virtual meeting. It'll be free. Um, you can become a member. You can join a committee. But uh, I'd love to see uh, more geriatricians and palliative care doctors and Jerry Pal listeners uh, joining the club. Awesome. Well, I want to thank all three of you for joining us. But before we, we go, maybe we can come together with a little bit more Beatles. He went on shoeshine. He got toe jam football. He got monkey finger. He shoot Coca-Cola. He said, I know you and you know me. One thing tell you is you got to be free come together right now over me what the heck is that song about alex i think that song's about a homeless person and their experience and how we should come together over people like this rather than uh, what he's saying which is just shoot me it's sort of in the background of the the verse. I don't, that's my interpretation. So, I, what do others think? That's actually worth the price of admission, right there. It's always baffled me the lyrics. I, I like it. <laughs> well, um, Ed, Benzi, Christine, big thank you for joining us for the Jerry Powell podcast. It was really wonderful to have you on. I encourage all of our listeners to check out the International uh, Neuropalliative Care Society, um, and we'll have a link on our show notes at the Jerry Powell website. And thank you, Artstone Foundation, for your continued support and all of our listeners for supporting the Jerry Powell podcast. Thanks, everybody. Good night.